Hello, everyone. My name is Arno Reese, and I'm a VMware Cloud Solution Architect. Chris White, Paolo Catalano, and I want to show you how to supercharge your SDDC using AWS Native Services. We'll cover what Amazon S3 is and how to use it, what FSx services for Windows and FSx on tap are, and why they're really such a big deal. And finally, we'll talk about a centralized traffic inspection with a gateway load balancer, and then a demo tying it all together. So let's go ahead and start with Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3 as it's better known. S3 really comes in on a cloud storage and petabyte scale. It has accessibility via APIs or the web console. Object storage is different than file or block storage that we've all been accustomed to. Object storage shows the data itself, a unique ID, and metadata. Data can be a single photo, log file, a massive backup file, or any unstructured data. Unique IDs show all the data to be found without knowing its disk location. Object storage solves the problem of data growth as well. S3 is extremely durable with 11 nines of durability. Data is replicated between at least three availability zones or data centers for maximum protection. And then to secure it all, AWS has a key management service that easily integrates with S3 storage and encrypts data at rest. There are also multiple lifecycle policies that are available in S3. There's S3 standard, which is the base storage. Then you can have data tiered to one infrequent access zone instead of three, which in this case would be one AZ that's more cost-effective retrieve and costs less to store. S3 Glacier is is an archive data policy that rarely ever gets accessed, but needs to be stored. Glacier takes a long time to recover, but less cost is a fraction of S3 standard. There are also additional S3 policies that can be used and leveraged. So what are some use cases that we have for S3 storage? For most backup vendors, they leverage S3 in some fashion. Some products like Commvault or NetApp can use backups directly to S3 and others like Veeam require backup to land on a performance tier. S3 can be used for VMware's content library. You can sync your templates and ISOs to an S3 bucket and leverage a common content library across all your on-prem and SDDC cloud environments. An example of log storage, for instance, is how VMC on AWS GovCloud does not leverage log insight for log collection. Instead, we use S3 and the logs are dumped to it for consumption. So let's take a look at the connectivity diagram. How does this all work? S3 is considered a regional service, meaning that it's not tied to a VPC or a virtual private cloud like other AWS resources. So for instance, it would be in Northern Virginia or Ohio. Typically, S3 is accessed via the internet, but since VMware Cloud on AWS or VMC is on the AWS network, we have a way of accessing S3 via the AWS backbone instead of the internet. This is done either via an AWS private link or a VPC endpoint. S3 traffic from the SDDC is sent over an ENI or an elastic network interface to the connected VPC or virtual private cloud, where we have a VPC endpoint shown here for the S3 service to be configured. Traffic can then flow through this endpoint directly to the S3 bucket. This not only speeds up access to the resource, but it also saves on egress charges. So let's talk a little bit about FSx for Windows File Server. We're going to cover two different ones. While you can use S3 to offload backup data to our vSphere content library from an SDD storage, S3 doesn't have a file system. So our Windows and Linux servers or Kubernetes containers have no way to interact with it natively. This is where Amazon FSx and their managed file systems come into play. There are several different options for FSx, but we're going to cover two of them today. We're going to focus on Amazon FSx for Windows File Server and Amazon FSx for NetTap on tap service. FSx for Windows provides you a fully managed Windows File Server in an Amazon VPC or virtual private cloud. The fully managed Windows File Server runs within this VPC. The NFS file system can be accessed via SIPS or SMB as end users would any other file system. It just happens to reside in the cloud. You can choose whether you want to deploy a single availability zone or multiple availability zones. You can pick from hard drives 
or SSDs for storage and how much bandwidth should be allocated. With the multi-AZ deployment options, the file servers have access and automatically fail over between avail other availability zones, protecting you from an, an AZ failure or an entire data center failure. Let's kind of look at the diagram and figure out how this works and how this all ties together. Again, we have the SDDC, the VMC on AWS SDDC on the left, and then the customer VPC on the right. When deploying an FSX for Windows File Server, you have two options on where it should be deployed. You can choose to utilize the same private subnet that is being used for the ENI or Elastic Network Interface that was deployed with the VMC or deploy in a completely separate subnet in availability zone. It should also be noted that you do have to have a Microsoft Active Directory domain that you're integrating with. This can either be done with the Amazon managed Microsoft AD or through a customer hosted Active Directory. One of the new additions to the Amazon FSX services is their partnership with NetApp to provide a fully managed NetApp on tap environment in the cloud. Prior to this, it's only been available on premise. So the fully managed NetApp on tap system in the cloud will enable you to integrate with on-prem NetApp with features such as SnapVault and SnapMirror, multiple connectivity options to guest VMs via iSCSI, NFS, SIFS, or SMB, and automatically tiers from SSDs to HDDs or solid state drives to standard hard drives based off of utilization. Services deployed in a highly resilient and available architecture utilizing multiple availability zones. Let's take a look at this particular diagram when we do an iSCSI connection. If you wanna leverage iSCSI initiator on a guest VM from the FSX ONTAP service, this is possible to be configured via the ENI or the Elastic Network Interface. You'll see that in the middle. This will allow a customer to mount additional storage to a guest VM running in the SDDC and have it hosted in the ONTAP service. Use cases can be anything from test dev environments where they share an on-prem uh, duplicated or replicated environment to on tap in the cloud and then mount to the test dev machines would be wonderful case there. Let's talk about how this would connect with a uh, NFS or SMB share slightly different. If the customer wants to use that with the guest VM that share via NFS or SMB has a different connect up connection methodology due to the floating management IPs of the on tap service. We must connect the ONTAP service via a VMware Transit Connect or a VMware Managed Transit Connect. Similar to FSX for Windows, this would be useful for offloading large SMB or NFS shares from the guest VMs to the ONTAP service, reducing the amount of consumed vSAN storage. Next, I'd like to introduce Chris White, who will be covering centralized traffic inspection with the gateway load balancer and the demo. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Arno, and thank you all for coming today to the webinar uh, to see how AWS Native Services uh, can work in concert with your VMware Cloud on AWS environment and help offload some of those tasks from your VMware Cloud on AWS environment. Um, alongside uh, leveraging those AWS Native Services for uh, storage offload like we can with S3 for maybe backups or FSx uh, for file storage, uh, another place that AWS really excels is actually traffic inspection. Um, and uh, this comes up often when we're talking to customers, especially as they move along in their cloud journey. And they've started to leverage a number of different native services and potentially have multiple VPCs out there. How do we ensure that these VPCs um, and the, the instances within those VPCs are uh, the traffic leaving them is, is appropriate, and it's what we want. Um, so oftentimes when on-prem, they'll have, you know, in, enterprises or organizations will have some type of firewall doing, doing egress filtering. So maybe a, Palo, a pair of Palo Altos or some ASA Firepowers or some checkpoint firewalls or some Fortinets. How do we do that within AWS? There's a couple of different ways that, that, that this can be accomplished and we'll go through th those today. And then once we're done with that, we'll go through a demo and actually see all of these different components in action alongside an SDDC. So hooking into an FSX for Windows uh, file share, an FSX for ONTAP file share, and then finally doing some egress filtering. So we'll see all of that in action. So first and foremost, uh, one, one concept that has been around inside AWS for a while is the transit VPC. 
So this really is just a VPC that is offering some type of network service uh, to an organization within VM within AWS. Um, and oftentimes that, you know, that network service can be egress filtering. So what does this look like within this transit VPC? Oftentimes it's going to be, you know, a couple of subnets across availability zones so that we have high availability. And then within those v those subnets, we're going to deploy firewall devices. So those could be Palo Altos or checkpoints or Fortinets, et cetera. Um, they're going to have some type of high availability, maybe heartbeat between them to ensure that one is up um, and that traffic is, is able to flow if one of them goes down. So say we lose an availability zone. Um, but that is going to be the, the method that we're going to um, to, to offer egress filtering within a transit VPC. As you can imagine, there's a, there's, there can be quite a bit of overhead with this. Um, you know, those, those, uh, firewall devices are going to be a bump in the wire. They're going to be, um, there's, there's going to be a certain amount of latency, uh, to doing the traffic filtering that way. And, um, and it's also going to be a large amount of management overhead as well to 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 manage those there's a lot of pieces that have to have to work um to ensure that if we lose an availability zone we're still able to flow traffic out to the internet from a vmware cloud on aws perspective the way that we would integrate with something like this as you can see here is we would leverage the vmware managed transit gateway or you might also have refer heard it referred to as the as vmware transit connect so we're going to build an stdc group um, with one or more SDDCs as, as a part, part of it. And then that's going to get, obviously, those are all going to get hooked into and a VMware managed transit gateway is going to get deployed. So this is, this is, all this is is just a transit gateway. It's just the same AWS transit gateway, the cloud router, for example, um, that uh, customers can leverage as well. But the difference is that VMware manages it at this point. Um, so it is really there to, to allow interconnectivity between SDDCs as well as to as easy connectivity to external services. So in this case, an external VPC, that would be the transit VPC. Um, external VPCs or external transit gateways are just VPCs or transit gateways that are owned by the customer that we're going to peer the VMware managed transit gateway to. That's really what that comes down, what that means. Um, but the unique thing with this is that across that managed VPC link or that managed external VPC link, we can actually manually set the default route. And then this default route would then get advertised back to the member SDDCs so that they now will send all of their unknown or default route traffic through the VMware managed transit gateway into the transit VPC. Additionally, um, we also have a number of customer VPCs out here on this side. Those are all peered or associated with a AWS managed transit gateway. And then that also has a default route to the transit VPC. So this is the way that a lot of customers have been offering or, or uh, handling egress filtering from uh, in the past. But within the last year or so, we've actually seen customers um, or a new service come from AWS that is simplifying a lot of this for for our customers and making this a little bit more performant and faster and that is the gateway load balancer so gateway load balancer was introduced a couple of years ago at, at reinvent um, and it allows you or an enterprise to have multiple virtual appliances virt virtual firewalls running in there and then it load balances between all those virtual appliances you can also set up scaling for those as well so as your traffic scales or as your egress needs scale uh, the the virtual appliances can also scale so the other thing that we have depicted here is is a relatively new feature to transit gateway that got introduced a few months ago at reinvent um, call that is uh, the ability for transit gateways within the same region to peer so we call that intra region peering of transit gateways. So now what we're able to do is offer a centralized egress filtering that offers a bump in the wire to uh, the to the traffic. So the traffic doesn't really know that it's getting filtered. Um, so we're able to offer more performant filtering um, 
to uh, the to the to the enterprises. So again, we have our SDDC group with the VMware Managed Transit Gateway. Across this peering link, we're now going to advertise the default route, and this transit gateway is also going to have a quad zero default route that points to this appliance or security VPC. We have our two transit gateway ENI, so this is the way that the transit gateway can interface with this appliance VPC. And then we also have a new concept called not only the gateway load balancer, but the gateway load balancer endpoint. So traffic is going to point to the gateway load balancer endpoint, and then this endpoint is unique in that it takes the traffic and encapsulates it with, a Gen with the Geneve protocol. So gateway load balancer completely works off the Geneve protocol. Um, so traffic will head to the gateway load balancer, which will then forward traffic onto the virtual appliances. These virtual appliances can strip that Geneve packet, do their traffic inspection, look at it, make sure, yep, you're not going to facebook.com, you're going to a, a site that I want you to, and forward that traffic back to the gateway load balancer and back to the gateway load balance endpoint to get forwarded out to the NAT gateway and out to the internet. So this secures the traffic, it keeps everything private until it actually needs to go out to the public, public internet. So what does this look like from a traffic flow? From our SDDC one, we head to the virtual the VMware Managed Transit Gateway, and across the interregion peering link to the great to the Transit Gateway ENI, onto the Gateway Load Balancer endpoint. Now we get encapsulated with Geneve to the Gateway Load Balancer to the virtual appliance. Traffic is inspected. It's approved by the by the appliance. Down back to the Gateway Load Balancer and then back to the gateway load balance endpoint. And then the, finally the traffic flows to the NAT gateway and out to the internet. So this is a very uh, simple way of offering traffic inspection um, while keeping it uh, as performant as possible um, for, for, the, for our customers and for the, for, the, uh, for the AWS resources as well. So now we're going to move on to the demo, and we'll take a look at all of these different pieces in action. We'll look at all the, de the, the various route tables to see how we're configuring this and some of the caveats with, say, an interregion peering link uh, for Transit Gateway, um, as well as actually f watching some traffic flows and seeing the traffic actually flow uh, correctly to the various endpoints. All right, now let's take a look at the demo um, and where we can see all these different components in action. So what, what have we built today? Um, we have a demo for uh, FSX for Windows as well as FSX for ONTAP. And finally, the uh, gateway load balancer configuration that we mentioned earlier. Um, I do want to give a big shout out um, to Palo Alto. They were, they were kind enough to hook us up with some trial licenses as well as support for getting the gateway load balancer configuration set up um, in AWS. So major shout out to, um, to uh, Palo Alto for their help and support in, in this demo. So first of all, what I wanna go over is the uh, a drawing of everything that we have built in AWS. So all of this, all of the architecture that we have built today um, is residing in U.S. West 2, the Oregon region, sp spread across the four different availability zones that are available in Oregon. So first of all, we've got our VMware clone on AWS SDDC. So that's represented by this box here. Um, we've got our small SDDC. We've got, obviously, our VCSA and our NSX manager underneath the management gateway. We also have our compute gateway um, with, a, with a VM living underneath of it on the default subnet. So the default subnet that gets deployed with your SDDC has a 192.168.1.0 slash 24 segment. That's where this test VM is gonna be living. We have also have built an SDDC group um, where this SDDC is a part and that is connected obviously to a VMware Transit Gateway or VMware Transit Connect. So this is, this is gonna prove pr pivotal um, in this setup. Additionally, we have our connected our, our sidecar VPC over here. We've I've named this the apps VPC. So inside this VPC is there's a subnet for VMC to integrate, and this is where the elastic network interfaces from, from VMC are deployed. Also in this um, in this VPC, we have a couple of other things deployed. 
Um, we have FSX for Windows deployed in this subnet as well. So this is where uh, our FSX for Windows is going to is going to reside, and we'll see that in action here in a little bit. We also have uh, Amazon's managed Microsoft Active Directory deployed in this uh, VPC as well. Um, both FSX for Windows and FSX for ONTAP require a Microsoft Active Directory to be available. Um, for FSX for ONTAP, it's not required unless you require uh, SMB shares. So um, in this scenario, we're, we're utilizing a Windows VM. So we need uh, a Microsoft Active Directory. So I've deployed a, micro, a managed Microsoft Active Directory here uh, named demo.local. Um, it's just a small Active Directory that's running there just so we can provide some authentication to, to both of those services, as well as to uh, the VM that's running in, AW, in uh, VMC and AWS. Of note, we also have this VPC peered with the Amazon Transit Gateway. So if we slide down here, you'll see that there is an Amazon managed or an Amazon Transit Gateway um, that is owned by the customer, in this case, uh, residing here, and this VPC is peered with it. We also have an intra-region peering set up between the Transit Connect and the AWS Transit Gateway, and we'll show that uh, in the demo as well as uh, some of the intricacies around the routing that is required for this to work. I have a test VPC over here with a couple of test Windows VMs, and we'll show the connectivity between all the services in this test VM as well, That uh, and this is obviously peered to the Transit Gateway. Below that, we have our FSX for ONTAP trans, um, VPC. So um, we've, I've decided to go ahead and deploy FSX for ONTAP uh, in its own uh, VPC uh, versus deploying it via the, uh, via the connected VPC. Um, and this is so that we have the ability to, to, to uh, share out SIF shares and, and route that traffic appropriately. When you deploy an FSX for ONTAP, um, it does span across two availability zones. So it requires two subnets, and in each subnet, it places um, the, the, uh, the SVM, the storage virtual machine, um, that actually hosts the, uh, the, the connections for FSX for ONTAP. And then finally, we have our security VPC. So this is where all of the uh, gateway load balancer information is going to reside. So again, peered with the transit gateway, we'll show this routing table too, and how we're forcing traffic, uh, default route traffic to this virtual to this uh, VPC. Um, but then again, here you can see as well, we've got our gateway load balancer with our two gateway load balancer endpoints. Um, we have uh, a fleet of Palo Altos deployed here. They're actually deployed across two subnets, and we'll show that here in a little bit. Um, we've got an appliance subnet in each location, and this is where both the Geneve-focused uh, interface as well as the management interface resides in the appliance subnet. And then there's a, set, there's a third interface on each Palos um, that is dedicated for egress, and this is just how Palo Alto um, has their overlay routing set up. From those egress, then we, uh, we send that traffic onto NAP gateways, which then egress out to the internet. So all in all, we've got uh, four different VPCs as well as an AWS um, uh, VMC on AWS deployed, two transit gateways, one of them being VMware managed, one of them being customer managed. Um, and traffic is able to flow between all the different uh, resources freely. And so we'll show that here in a little bit. Um, I think what's really unique here is that from our test VPC, we can obviously access um, both our FSX for ONTAP and FSX for Windows shares um, through Transit Gateway. And then additionally, through Transit Gateway um, in the in the peered uh, Transit Connect, we can access uh, FSX for ONTAP from the VM. And then from uh, the uh, Elastic Network interface here, or going to the VPC, that, that same VM can access FSX for Windows. So we'll show all of that working in this in this setup. So now we'll flip over and take a look at um, our AWS and our VMC setup. So we'll start with, with VMC. We have our, our uh, SDDC deployed. It's just a OneNote SDDC um, at the moment. Um, and we'll take a look at our SDDC group. So this is the, uh, the VMware Managed Transit Gateway, the VMware Transit Connect that we have deployed um, alongside. Obviously, we've got our SDDC deployed here. Um, and then under external transit gateway, external TGW, here is our transit gateway that is uh, owned by the customer. So we can drill into this a little bit. Here's our peering attachment. Um, and we can see that here that the transit gateway location and the region are exactly the same. So we are doing an intra-region peer. 
And then under the routes section, this is what's cri critical for this piece of the of the architecture to work. Um, we are advertising the default, or we're setting the default route here, which advertises the default route back to the SDDC, forcing all of the default route traffic to head over this transit gateway link. This is what allows us to then uh, handle that traffic on the AWS side and force it over to the gateway load balancer. This also means that we can reach resources um, within AWS as well, like FSX for ONTAP, and we'll show that here in a little bit. But what's crucial to know is that anything that's in the connected VPC is actually going to go over the ENI. It's not going to ride over this transit gateway because that route is is also explicitly defined in the NSX routing table. So we can show that here. So here is a trace route. We're coming from the from the VM that I have running in VMC. Uh, you can see the IP address is 192.168.1.2, um, and then we're trying to reach. Um, one of the directory service uh, AD servers, so 10.240.240.7. So this is the Amazon managed Active Directory. Here, this is one of the EC2 instances that's hosting that. And we can see here that from 192.168, we go through the NSX environment, through the services uplink to the connected VPC. And so we can see that here as well, that, that the traffic gets delivered to the connected VPC. So it's important to note that uh, when you have resources running in the connected VPC, they are going to ride that ENI. They might not necessarily go over the if that uh, the the transit gateway if that is also set up to the connected VPC. Um, so let's talk routing for a second. We've we 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 reviewed the uh, the transit gateway route here. Let's go take a look at the transit gateway route table. So this is the route table for the transit gateway that is residing in AWS. Um, We'll take a look at the attachments first. So we have a number of different attachments. We obviously have an attachment to each of the VPCs that we have deployed in AWS. So there's the, the peering attachment for the FSX for ONTAP uh, a VPC, as well as the security VPC, the apps VPC, and then our test VPC. And then finally here, you can see this one, white YTEC SDDC group peering. This is our transit gateway to transit gateway peering attachment. Um, and there's nothing really unique about this except that we're peering to another transit gateway instead of to a VPC. What is unique is now the routing table. Um, so if we come down here to the transit gateway route table and we take a look at the routes, we'll see a few things. Um, we obviously have a route to each of the VPCs. So the 10.230.0, the 240.0, 249.0, and 250.0. We also have a route to 198.19255.0 slash 24, and that's going to a VPC. So you might ask, what is that? Well, as part of the FSX for ONTAP deployment, um, they actually deploy a floating IP address for the FSX for ONTAP management IP. And this is also the IP address that you're going to utilize for SIFs and NFS. You might recall from when Arno was talking through the diagram of uh, for FSX for ONTAP that we actually require um, that that uh, IP address be part of, uh, or that the, the, the connection to FSX for ONTAP go through a transit gateway. And this is why we have this management IP address, but this IP address is not advertised through the normal route tables. So we have to list it here and then we handle that route uh, within the actual FSX for ONTAP VPC's route table. And I'll show that here in a little bit, but we have that route table. We also have a quad zero route, and this is going to a VPC um, that is the the, v, the security VPC. And you can see that we had to statically add that route to this. So we're forcing Transit Gateway to handle any unknown traffic and force that over to um, the security VPC. And then the security VPC has route table rules within it to handle that traffic appropriately. Finally, we have our Transit Gateway peering routes. And you'll notice that these are also static. So something of note is that when you do an intra-region peer between two transit gateways, the routing is not shared between those two transit gateways. So for traffic to, to enter from the AWS side and reach um, back into VMC, you have to explicitly um, define those routes in the transit gateway route table. So you'll notice here we have a 250.00 slash 23. This is our management subnet for VMC. And we also have a 192.168.1.0 slash 24, which is, of course, the compute segment that gets deployed uh, alongside VMC as the default. Um, if we were to add additional compute segments in here, we would have to have additional routing statements within transit gateway to get back to the to the VPC. So 
you can imagine that this can start to become a little bit cumbersome to manage. This is why it's really important to plan your, your segments and your ciders appropriately so that you can aggregate them as best as possible to reduce um, the, the, uh, the, the amount of manual work you have to do when adding segments uh, to, to the Transit Gateway route tables. So let's go take a look at our FSX for ONTAP route table in here. So we have a single route table in here. It's a default route table. And if you look at here into the, into the route table, this is this is common across all of the VPCs. We have a, a local routes for the, the VPC CIDR range that we have in, this, in the VPC. But then we also have a quad zero for the transit gateway. And so this just says that any traffic I don't know about, send to the transit gateway. You could explicitly define this so I could have a 250 and a 249 and a 240, but obviously it gets a little bit cumbersome to manage as well. So it's just easier, and, and especially in this demo's case, to define a quad zero route and send all that traffic to the transit gateway. But what also is unique here is these two 198, 192, 255, 135, and 204 IP addresses. These are the two floating IP addresses for, for the FSX for ONTAP. Uh, management IP addresses. And you can notice that they're going to two ENIs or to the same ENI. So these are managed by AWS. And if we do have a failover of those of those uh, interfaces, then then um, AWS handles that failover and, and starts pointing the traffic to the new ENI. Um, but it is important to note that these are defined in here um, by AWS and they're, they're static. So this is what's required for, um, for FSX for ONTAP to operate. So if we flip over and take a look at FSX for ONTAP in here, again, you can see here, here's the endpoint IP address range for that, for that uh, endpoint. And then we can see here, we have our management endpoint address right now of .135. This is managed by AWS automatically. Um, it's also auto, um, updated to the uh, Active Directory DNS. So whatever you set as the DNS, for active or whatever you said is the active directory uh it's going to go update this if something were to if that ip address were to change or the endpoint the management endpoint was were to change so that allows you to actually connect to um say in the, in our case an fsxn.svm.01 um url instead of this long dns name we also have two intercluster endpoint IP addresses, and these can be used for iSCSI connectivity. So, um, if you want, if you want uh, FSX for ONTAP to um, to advertise or to to present an iSCSI share or an iSCSI mount to your guest VMs, that is how you would connect us through those two um, intercluster endpoint IP addresses. Okay, so now we're taking a look at one of my um, one of the test uh, EC2 instances that's running in AWS, um, and I'm just logged in locally, and you can see here that uh, I have two network location shares uh, on each of these. So we have an FSX for Windows and an FSX for ONTAP. And if we go look at the properties for each of these, actually, we'll do this. We can see that for FSX for Windows, we're connecting to the share name. And then for FSX for ONTAP, we're actually connecting to the, the, the storage virtual machine. Um, both of these are managed through Active Directory. So all of our authentication and management is through Active Directory. Um, but, but to prove that these actually work, we can open these up. We can see that we're on the FSX for Windows. We'll create a new file and say te test file. Windows, which is cool. Hello from AWS. Save that. And equally, we can also go to FSX for ONTAP and create a new file. And this will come into play here in a second.
we'll also see that that uh, we are able to connect to the internet. So we have our we're we're on the domain. So this this uh, EC2 instance has been joined to our our demo domain. It's also got internet access, so we can open up Chrome and access. Say we we can obviously go, get to Google.com, um, but we can also go to if I can type VMware.com and pull up VMware. So we're obviously able to access the internet from this VM. And so what we'll see in a, in a little bit is that this is actually being filtered through the uh, the gateway load balancer and the Palo Altos um, that, that uh, we have set up in our for our egress filtering. So we'll close that out. And now if we flip over to this VM, this is our, our uh, VM that's actually running in uh, VMC on AWS. So um, we're able to... Uh, to also connect to this guy and we can go in here and look at the FSX for Windows and there's our file. And there we can see that it's active and we just edited it. And here's our FSX for ONTAP file. And equally, we're able to open a web browser Pull in all of our information and go to VMware.com. We can also see that from down here, we are still joined to the domain. So we're joined to the same demo.local domain. Uh, and we do have internet access. And this is being provided through, again, the gateway load balancer. So pretty cool that, that all of this works together. And then finally, here is one of our Palo Altos that's running in VMC or in AWS. Uh, and if we refresh this, this is our traffic monitoring page. We can see that both 210.249.249.58 accessed the internet um, and, we, and the traffic was allowed. And equally, we can see that 192.168.1.2 was also accessing the internet through SSL and was allowed. Um, and I can also start a ping. from our VM and in about a few seconds, once this refreshes, we'll see that ICMP traffic coming through. And there we go. There's our ICMP traffic coming through and get and reaching the internet. So how is all this set up? Well, let's flip over back over to AWS and take a look at that. So if we go take a look at our security VPC and we look at our subnets, we'll have quite a few subnets in here. And there's a number that uh, we'll need to talk through. So obviously our two transit gateway subnets are, are the two subnets that we leverage uh, when attaching to the transit gateway. And this is where the transit gateway places ENI so the traffic can get into the VPC. So we can see our subnet, ra our su our subnet range is there. We have two appliance subnets. This is where the Palo Altos are actually deployed as well as the gateway load balancer endpoints. Um, and then we have two uh, egress subnets. So um, as part of the Palo Alto setup, we also have to have egress subnets, a separate subnet from the ingress that Palo Alto utilizes to then send the um, the over the the traffic out to the internet. So that's what those two are. And then we have finally two NAT gateway subnets. So if we look at our routing tables. We have a number of routing tables in this as well. Um, in our transit gateway route tables, we'll take a look at the, the A side first. And the A side and the B side are gonna be exactly the same, just pointing at different uh, locations. So we have a 10 250 250 slash 24, and then we have a 000, we have a, we have a default route, and all of that traffic heads to the VPC endpoint. If we look at our appliance subnet, 
we also can see again the local route and then we have two routes back to the transit gateway so this is for return traffic so again we have to manually define these so again route aggregation would be would be critical here in a, in a larger deployment um, but for our two subnets that we have traffic coming from so the test subnet the test vpc as well as the um, default subnet in in the uh, vmc we have both of those defined here as destinations with the destination pointing towards the transit gateway in the security route table again quad zero now pointing at the NAT gateway so that all the egress traffic from the uh, from the S from the the gateway load balancers and from the the appliances heads towards the NAT gateway and then we also have our local route and finally our NAT gateway we have internal so this is now return traffic from the internet we have to handle as well so again we have our 192.168.10 and our 249.0 slash 24 now pointing both at the VPC endpoint. So again, we're pointing back to the VPC endpoint for traffic coming back in so that it can get filtered and then sent back to, uh, to the, the source. So we have both of those manually defined as well as our quad zero heading towards the internet gateway that's attached to the VPC. If we come down here to our, actually load balancers is over here. So if we come down here to our load balancers, we have a single load balancer deployed. It is a gateway load balancer. You can see here under the type gateway and our two availability zones. And then we have a listener defined, which is the gateway load balancer target group here. And what you'll notice here is that we're actually listening on a Geneve protocol. So 68 UDP 6081 is Geneve, it's the Geneve protocol, and that is what we're actually testing against for the for the gateway load balancer appliances. We can see here we have two to, two um, healthy targets, so they're responding appropriately. Additionally, um, in here we also have an endpoint service defined. So this is the gateway load balancer endpoint. And then we have to place that gateway load balancer endpoint uh, in a couple of VPCs. So this is this is attached to the gateway load balancer. And then we deploy the endpoints uh, in the two appliance VPCs. So this is all laid out in the, in the AWS documentation. It's actually fairly simple to set up. It's just a lot of components that you have to place and a lot of planning and prep that, that you have to do. And this is where working with a AWS Solutions Architect as well as the VMware Cloud Solutions Architect uh, really helps in, as part of this deployment to make sure that uh, all, these, all these pieces are uh, well defined. So that is, that is it for, for the demo. Um, I, you know, again, appreciate everybody's time today um, in, in coming to the, uh, to the presentation. And hopefully you can see how uh, how some of these uh, these AWS native services can really help you um, get your environment up and running and uh, available in AWS and how you can leverage both AWS native services as well as um, VMC to to modernize start modernizing your your workloads and it doesn't start stop with you know, services like the storage service or gateway load balancer and egress filtering. There's 250 plus odd AWS native services that all can be leveraged with VMC, including the relational database service, RDS. So RDS would be great if you've got databases that you don't want to necessarily have to manage anymore, but you really need um, that dedicated performance. You can absolutely leverage RDS to, to host, a, you know, one or more databases. Um, and then there's other services, there's security services, there's content delivery services. Um, there's uh, obviously load balancing services as well that can be leveraged with, with AWS. Plus there's a whole um, bevy of, of uh, third party solutions in the AWS marketplace that can be deployed alongside um, in, in AWS VPCs that can, that can work with uh, the AWS or with the VMware Cloud and AWS. So again, thank you guys for coming out today. We really appreciate uh, your time and your attention and uh, we'll, we'll uh, stop this now and, and open it up for questions. Thank you.